Now, over the course of the last few months, I would say that we have built ourselves quite the reputation uh, as being one of the few places where free speech is allowed, where people can say what they want, where people can say what they think, and where people can argue with me about almost any subject under the sun. I'm delighted to say uh, that we're going to welcome a new voice here to the Independent Republic, and it's a Helen Dale, a writer, a lawyer, political commentator, originally from Australia, now ensconced in this part of the world. Helen, a very good morning to you. Welcome. Hello, Mike. How are you? I'm very well indeed. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, I think I'm right in saying that we're always on the lookout for what can only be described as kind of, you know, fresh voices, fresh faces, fresh kind of ideas. People who, like you, are interested in kind of pushing the envelope a little bit, trying to work out what it is that uh, that we are all about here, uh, living as we do on this one planet Earth, trying to make sense of it all and trying really, really hard to fight back against what I call the forces of darkness, i.e. Uh, the wallies that want us to behave. <laughs> yes, yeah, constantly being told what to do and what to say. Yeah. I have to say, I didn't know about you until Neil Oliver, because I've known Neil Oliver for quite a long time. Okay. And so I found you through Neil Oliver because he tweeted his interviews, so I watched them. Right, and he's <laughs> and an amazing a, man. He's an amazing man. Every, every, you know, every, every week we talk to him and every week both he and I have a conversation sort of on a messaging before he comes on. What are we going to talk about this week? And I'm always like, well, you know, I thought your column was quite interesting. Let's start with that and see where it goes. And we just kind of riff, really, and it just kind of goes into all sorts of interesting places. And I'm, I'm sort of trying to, to build up a, a stable of people like that, of which I think you will now become one, uh, where we just kind of talk about stuff, you know, because... You know, it's, it's, it's like you would sit down in your living room or in a pub and just have a conversation about what's right, what's wrong, what you think is going on. And it doesn't necessarily have to have a point. I don't have to keep interrupting you and correcting you and making sure that you don't, you know, in some way, um, you know, cross the boundaries of decency and all of the stuff that you have to do if you appear on the BBC for three and a half nanoseconds, you know. So so let's talk about... Yes, your... I, have, I have been on Newsnight. That was a very interesting experience. Yes, I'm sure it would it be. It was a couple of years ago now, and I'm not sure I want to do it again. No, and I think people are beginning to wake up, you know, because the people of, of both Australia and this country and America and all of the kind of the five eyes, if you like, uh, the countries uh, that we call ourselves together on, they are, you know, the people are quite smart, you know, they're not idiots and they are being talked down to all the time by people in the media who think they're cleverer than everybody else, who think they're better than everybody else. And I'm afraid they're not. Well, the, this was brought home to me when uh, I mainly got known in the UK at uh, because I did a lot of Brexit coverage and I covered Brexit for The Australian, which is the main national daily in Australia. And then I started being asked to write about it for publications over here, including The Spectator and The mm. Tory Graph. And the th I thought after that happened, oh, well, I'll be able to go on and write my fourth novel now because people will lose interest in the lawyer who writes about Brexit and constitutional law. But one of the things I did manage to show while I was writing about Brexit was that I'm numerous. I mean, I did reasonably well in maths at school <laughs> and but that's literally what it is it's a good result in a maths a level and so what started to happen in march and one of them one commission i said no to because it was asking me to do something i didn't know anything about which you know, to pretend to be an epidemiologist basically right but uh, is please write some pieces on coronavirus and some of them i said yes to but the ones that wanted me to mug in a discipline that i'd in which I have no training, um, I said no to. But I became aware very quickly of what was going on here, which was, and you noticed it at the, the daily presses, uh, the media class was innumerous. Yeah. You had all these people, extraordinary numbers of people who simply didn't understand, G well, GCSE maths, basically. Mm. The, I mean, it was the stuff that they were getting wrong, apart from the, some of the stuff about exponential functions, which is a bit trickier. But nearly everything they were getting wrong, like the calculation of RO and that kind of thing, was just basic, the first couple of years of high school maths. And I just thought, all of these people are sitting here telling us how clever they are, mm. and they can't do sums. Right. I'm horrified. Right. And also, they seem to be incapable of following any sort of logical pattern of conversation as well. You know, when you see the likes of Robert Peston writing a oh, question... Oh, he, um, he was the one that really alarmed yeah, me at first. Yeah, well, I mean... I, is, I, I knew it was a bipartisan issue because I talked to a friend of mine um, who, who runs a small media company, and she's also numerate. And she just said, 
I'm sorry, I used to agree with Robert Peston a mm. lot. And then I've just watched him ask the most ridiculous and enumerate questions and I'm horrified and I want to pick up a corner of the liner and crawl underneath. Right. And I just thought, so it's not just me. And she was a Remainer and a lifelong Labour voter and all of that kind of thing. So it wasn't just me. A lot of people noticed this and how bad it was. Yes. And I mean, I come from a background of sort of tabloid newspapers where, um, you know, the cleverest people in journalism that I've ever known have always worked for tabloids because what you have to do is you have to kind of dilute and melt down some of the most complex issues and get them into four paragraphs and get them into a way of, of understanding for people uh, who would find otherwise a very lengthy, perhaps, article a little bit complicated. But what we seem to have now is a, is a journalist class of people who want to make it sound more complicated than it is so that only they can kind of determine what it is that's going on. Well, I mean, there's that old joke. I don't know whether... Um it's true in every particular, but the story was that the mirror and the, the journalists at the mirror and the journalists at the Guardian swapped yeah. to do some, to do, I, I don't know whether it was a weekend issue or whether it was a day, one of the daily papers. It was a quite a few years ago now. And the mirror journalists could do the Guardian journalist job no problems. Yeah. And the Guardian journalists were all absolutely stuffed <laughs> and having to call the mirror people up and say, please help. Yes. We can't do this. We can't write it in 600 words. Yes, they can't manage to melt it down. But, I mean, you've written on some very interesting pieces uh, 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 of time. You wrote a piece in, in July about the BBC. Uh, you've written about cancel culture as well. I mean, how do you find your audience? Do you kind of feel as though the audience that you have is already there? Are you reaching a new audience? Are you convincing more people to come around to your way of thinking? How's, it, how's that all going? Well, the, the piece that was in The Spectator this week, which I've tweeted out and you can have a read of it, um, was very much about how I haven't been cancelled Nobody is stopping me from writing from a wide number of publications, mainly in the UK and Australia, as you would expect, right. uh, because my first novel won the Miles Franklin Award, which is the Australian equivalent of the Booker Prize, and it became a big bestseller. Right. And that meant that I had an opportunity to, to write in the national press first in Australia and then in the UK. I'm a dual national and I went to university over here. I went to Oxford and then to Edinburgh. And so I had no problem getting an an audience to read my stuff because there was this novelist with this big prize. It's certainly not in Australia. What I noticed though, was that it changed over time. And this is what my spectator piece was about. And it's a change that I find quite alarming because mm. I've written about cancel culture quite a few times before, but the first time I wrote about it was in the guardian in 2015. Mm. Now I'm quite conservative. I mean, a proper sort of traditional, conservative Tory member of the Tory party they are they are I'm, I'm cancelled now and 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 that kind of thing and when I was in Australia I worked for a politician who was also in the classical liberal tradition of conservatism so kind of like Margaret Thatcher yeah he, he was a senator and his name was David Lionhelm he's retired now and but at the same token left-leaning publications had no problem going oh Helen can you please write about X for us? Mm. And I had a perfectly satisfactory and pleasant relationship with people at The Guardian, people elsewhere, to the point where I could write about cancel culture. And I did in 2015 using a mixture of Australian and UK and American case studies. Right. And people thought it was fine. The article was popular. I wrote other things for them. And then I noticed as a result of 2016, and I actually went and looked up my media archive and found that the last time I wrote for The Guardian was in July 2016. So it was after Brexit or after the leave vote, but before Donald Trump. Right. And suddenly the doors were shut. So basically what was happening, and this is why I call it the silo effect. I, I grew up in the country. So you need to imagine those big grain mm. silos you see pictures of in country Australia, the big metal things with hoppers next to them to pour the grain in, 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 in the sheet wheat belt areas of, of country Australia. And so what was happening, and the thing is you have to keep the light and the moisture out or otherwise it starts to turn into beer, yes. basically. And, occ and occasionally, <laughs> occasionally people fall into them and die. Is, and yes, yes, you I do get things it. like that. So, but <laughs> the, the point is they're sealed. Right. And what I noticed was that people were t finishing up in their ideological silos. Right. Now, I don't like that because I don't think that I'm right all the time. And any conservative who gets into this whole thing of thinking you're right all the time, you, fin you finish up becoming just like the people you're criticising mm. and you can't do that. I mean, I am absolutely determined to not land finish up in a silo at least intellectually so i have subscription 
for example, my main left wing source of reading is the London Review of Books. Mm. And I do it deliberately and I read it regularly, even though I disagree with m much of what is in there. I know it's well written. I know it's well researched and I have respect for the editorial values of the people who run the magazine. But by the same token, I mean, I write regularly for The Spectator and The Australian and, and uh, Quillette. And I know that the people who are ideologically opposed to me don't read those and they don't seek them out. And I think that's very, very dangerous yeah. because you finish up in this situation where people are completely convinced that they're right all the time mm. and they only read comfort food it's like the it's the intellectual equivalent of comfort food yes. is the phrase that i use in my article well i well i was uh, go, harking back to rod little's um, wife's comment which was on the day of the referendum result when she took the kids to school uh, where they live in a very nice leafy part of i think kent or sussex or somewhere like that um and she said she came back to to, to the house after having dropped the kids at school and she said all the mums were standing aghast at the gates of the school because they couldn't believe that people had voted for brexit because they didn't know anyone that would have done that and it was like well that's because you don't mix with people other than the people that you stand outside the school gates with you have no idea or concept of what other people think because you don't know uh, who they are you don't listen to anybody outside of your own sort of intellectual bubble um, and you mix only with each other and so that's the problem that we i think have and we need to fix that in this country otherwise i think we're going to head for a very dark place indeed well the thing that is alarming about that sort of thing that didn't used to exist to the same extent in Britain as it does in the United States is political segregation and scholars like Matthew Goodwin yeah. ha, um, at the University of Kent have written about this where what happens is that happened was that people who voted remain tend to live in very geographically concentrated areas and mm. don't know any leavers whereas leavers are more diffuse I mean which is why the there was great electoral benefit to, to being the party of leave for the Conservatives in, to, in December 2019, because they're more diffuse and they're all over the country. They can not only swing more seats, but because of that diffuse geographical distribution, you finish up with a situation where a leaver will talk to many remainers mm. as well as to lots of leavers as well. And this is a well-known phenomenon in, in political science and in, in psychiatry, which is where conservatives and i have to say in in this country it includes left leaning leavers as well because they are a small minority mm. are much better at reading and understand and i mean reading not in terms of a newspaper article or a magazine or the internet but reading as in psychologically understanding their opponents because they're exposed to them more regularly they're they're forced out of the silo i was forced out of my silo i'm quite conservative but because i was a novelist and most people in the arts are left-leaning yeah. and I was always in the minority I mean there was a joke made about me that I use on my Twitter that was by an Australian left-leaning newspaper they called me Australian literature's lone classical liberal <laughs> and I think it was meant to be a slur and I didn't oh, that sounds quite, that sounds I, quite I, good. Yes, and so I thought I'm going to keep that yeah. that's mine now <laughs> yeah exactly right and, I mean it was like when the observer wrote a piece about me uh, and talk radio and basically told them told them the, the world of, of, of observer readership that I was the kind of king of the anti-woke shock jocks I was like I'm having that I'll take that all the way to the, to the bank Thank you very well much if you indeed. want to be I mean he's just retired now but if you really want to be absolutely heroic and occupy a position in British political culture that is akin to an Australian radio announcer then you want to be Britain's Alan Jones okay I'll look out. Says, uh, Alan Jones, he's retired now, but he owned Sydney Radio right. and many other radio stations in Australia, but particularly in Sydney for decades. Yeah. And he, he became the voice of the sort of centre right and the right mm. in the country. That wasn't to say he was always right or that he always got the right end of the stick. Yeah. But he did have this captivating quality, Alan Jones did, uh, and dragged in huge numbers of listeners particularly many working class and ethnic yes. minority listeners which well they know of course they, they know how to do uh, talk radio in australia in the same way they know how to do it in america and we've never known how to do it in this country properly it's because i not believe part of the tradition well no because we've been ruined by the bbc because the bbc has got such a grip uh, on the culture in this country uh, that i think they've poisoned it 
That's really unfortunate because you do need a lively. I mean, Australia has the ABC, which is the national broadcaster. Right. Which and I and I have to say, I have a lot of. I mean, you've had Calvin Robinson on here, who's had a lot to do with the defund the BBC. Yeah. And I'm sympathetic to their arguments, and I like Calvin enormously, and I think he's very clever and and very sensible. But a lot of the suggestions about oh, just make the BBC funded through central taxation, the way the ABC is in mm. Australia, I don't think it would work. The ABC of Australia is not as good as the BBC and it is more biased. Yeah. You cannot rely on the news aspect of the ABC in Australia. It will often leave out telling facts. Yeah. Whereas I've very, very seldom seen the BBC do that unless it's been something like the innumeracy I was talking about, yes. where it's not political bias. You're just dealing with a journalist who's not done any maths since, right. since O-Level. Although, although I would say that you're, you're right to say that, that generally speaking, the BBC is not as bad as the, its critics make it out to be. However, mm. it's not so much in how they report the news. It's in what they report. And I think one of the things they're very guilty of is ignoring quite a few stories that go on, which lots of people are talking about, but which they don't deem important enough to make the news. Well, there's even been an element of it with the Lebanon issue. Yeah. People are having to be told now as a result of this accident, and it's not terrorism, it's clearly an accident. Yeah. But people are now having to be told in what the, what a parlous state country of Lebanon is and despite the fact that it used to be this lovely sunny place where mm. people went off and and because they all spoke French and yeah. had patisseries and lovely and wine, nice and, wine yeah. you know uh, I mean all of that kind of thing and people are now having to be told all of this background information about the terrible situation that Lebanon is in and has been in for many years mm. precisely because the BBC and it was the BBC just totally failed to pay any attention to Lebanon, yeah. despite what was going on in Syria and Iraq, which right. are you know nearby countries. Exactly. So and that's an the, example of it. Yeah, and yeah. the fact that you know the basic uh, government of Lebanon uh, is corrupt, uh, is is linked to Hamas, um, and is a dreadful and ghastly organisation, which is strangling. Well, they use this uh, strangling they use this its pillar own people. System. They use this pillar system or millet system. Uh, which is very, very common in countries with, that are divided between Islam and Christianity. Yeah. And it's a very, very bad system of governance. There's a lot of empirical evidence to show that it doesn't work. Mm. You know, where basically you have Muslims in one corner and Christians in another corner. And historically, before they were all killed or thrown out, you, had, mm. you also had, you had Jews and Orthodox yeah. as well. Right. Um, uh, governing themselves with their own laws... And even having different rules about contract and different rules about commercial arrangements and different rules about education and schooling, things that should be set at the centra either centralised or at the state level and should be applied to everyone uniformly. But people do it because it's it means you don't have nasty fights. Mm. Exactly, it, right. it's a way to try and avoid religious sectarianism, but it's 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 cheap, but it's not cheerful, and it doesn't work very well. It really doesn't, and and the BBC of all organisations should be much better at reporting on that sort of thing, and I think that's part. The, of the irony problem. is, of course, the irony is, of course, the reason I know that little detail about Lebanon is because Australia has famously taken very very large numbers of Lebanese immigrants, particularly the Lebanese Christians, mm. and. I mean, for example, Marie Bashir was the governor of New South Wales and Lebanese Maronite background. No. And I mean, to the point where Australia, I mean, this is the basis of the country's immigration policy. Literally, it's just Australia PLC. It goes around the world and just creams the top, the best, mm. off of huge numbers of countries' immigrant groups. And, and I, it's probably fair to say that in a minor way, Australia has contributed to the problems in Lebanon by taking so many people of talent from that country. Yeah. And well, they do very well in Australia. They're, they're the classic market dominant minority and, or modern yeah, minority. And just kind of hollowing it out. Let me ask you about Boris Johnson and the Conservatives here, Helen, because as a classical kind of Conservative yourself, you must look at some of the things that the Boris Johnson administration is doing and, and scream in terror and run out of the room. Well, I am cons I'm concerned about two things. One, he won't keep those Northern and Midlands voters yeah. unless he takes a strong stand on cultural issues, on education, for yeah. example. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I would make Catherine Burblesing, the, the headmistress of Michaela, the education czar in this yeah. country and just basically make every school in the country a, a replica Michaela right. with a replica Michaela curriculum. Um, and all the, the same sort of rules, mm. because they're the kinds of things that people in those areas who have been underserviced and have been given, you know, not been 
treated well in terms of the education system wants. So I think there's that issue going on there. He will not keep those voters unless he takes a cultural stand. I mean, these were people who stood on the doorstep and told Tory canvassers, and I know this because I'm in the Conservative Party, things like, Jeremy Corbyn got up and announced his pronouns. It's nonsense. There were more Palestinian flags at Labour conference than there were Union Jacks. Right. You know, things like this were being said on the doorstep. Hmm. You know, my child comes home from school and can't do maths. Right. Things like this were said. Um, as well as complaints about Labour canvassers behaving badly. That was the other thing that came back. Oh, they, they were rude to me, or they mm. called my grandmother a racist, right. or, uh, or, you know, and said things like, and in one particular situation, they said the grandmother was a racist mm. in one story that I encountered. And it was a mixed race couple. And the grandmother in question, who was being traduced, came over to the country on the Windrush. Right. And, you know, and she turns up in the background with her grey hair, and she just said, oh, good. <laughs> so there's that so there's that part of it right. and then there's the other thing is <sighs> nanny statism doesn't work sugar taxes don't work no other countries have tried these things including countries with higher state capacity than the united kingdom like denmark and australia they don't work you know australia had a huge issue with these things electronic cigarettes and tried to make them illegal and people were importing them from britain and buying them from the nhs mm. and then bringing them to Australia. It was ridiculous. This, this was an issue when I was working for Senator Lionhill, that it was, it, the country was becoming a laughing stock. Yeah. It doesn't work. Australia has much higher smoking rates than the UK uh, now because of the attitude to vaping as opposed to what happened uh, over here where yeah. people were much more relaxed about it. Take your cue from that. If you want people to lose weight, then you need to get them out and get them exercising and moving. You know, telling them they can't have another Mars bar isn't going to work. No. Because people just resent it. Of course. And, and, and we don't like to be treated like idiots. Listen, Helen, uh, you've proven uh, the point that you are very much now a new member of the Independent Republic because uh, we've had to cut it short. I had no idea we were already talking for 25 minutes. So so let's do it again. Oh, sorry about no, that. No, no, not at all. Absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Let's do it again soon. Thank you so much for talking to us. Helen Dale, uh, who is, of course, uh, an author, uh, a thinker, um, a person of great merit for the Independent Republic of Mike Graham. I hope you enjoyed uh, talking and listening to her. Uh, she's a lawyer as well um, one of the few lawyers I actually like many lawyers of course are out there uh, who I don't like particularly barristers particularly Jolien Moron uh, and that woman uh, Seymour whatever her name is